Mark, you had a chance to meet some of our shareholders and take some questions at the AGM. What did the questions that you guys got tell you about what Norwich City means to its supporters? Well, a number of things. And actually, this is my second AGM. I, I attended one last year, just weeks into first investing. Uh, what comes across most pointedly is the passion and the interest. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting to sit up on that stage and see a, a cross section of the community. But the questions went from everything as detailed as a financial question on page 72 of the materials to uh, some comments on the pies and whether they, the taste of the pie was good. <laughs> the topic that came up is quite, you know, fairly on field performance at the moment. What could you say to the people who weren't in the room, obviously not shareholders, of what the board said about on-field performance and the footballing direction of the club? So, uh, look, the board, and I think we reflected it, but we, we all uh, are as passionate as the fans are, and we live and die with every goal in either direction. Really, our, our job is to give the resources to the sporting director and, and the coach and the, and the staff and the, and the players to succeed and do their best. For example, yesterday, one of the things I did is tour the new aquatic center. Uh, it is absolutely state-of-the-art. I wish we had something like that in Milwaukee for Major League Baseball. You have guys who are able to train while injured. We watched Josh Sargent train yesterday a little bit. Uh, able to do things in, in a pool that you, you couldn't do yet at its stage of his recovery on, on hard ground. And, and so that, that's really our job as a board. We can't, uh, can't play for the players. We can't direct you know, the tactics as the coach. Uh, but we can support the players and the coach and, and the sporting director uh, as best we can. So will you personally have any input on any footballing decisions that are made or is that something you'll leave to Ben Napper? <laughs> I think I'm going to leave that to Ben Napper. <laughs> I'm still learning the, the positions. Uh, and one of the great things about Ben is he spent 14 years at Arsenal seeing the best of the best and how they work. And he was a top performer there. So... Uh, He's already uh, well into his planning for what to do with the with the club. He doesn't, you know, it. He's he's been in the seat eighteen days, as he says. He's actively been looking at this because he was interviewing for three months. But till the plan is complete, he doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to unveil it uh, in in you know mid form. Do you feel that this is a period of change for the club? Ben talked last night about a cycle. Is that something, the language that's being used between the board and when you're discussing things with Ben? Uh, look, you see this in all sports. You see it uh, certainly in baseball. Teams go through uh, periods of, you know, we're somewhat in a golden age of Brewers baseball right now for us. At some point, you have to retool you know, as players age. Uh, we had a natural cycle here because we've had a change in sporting director. And you've had a real run of success. It doesn't feel that way now because... Uh, you know, we're on uh, what, what is for us harder times. There's a lot of teams that would be, like to be comfortably in the middle of the championship table. That's not our goal, and uh, and so it's. I look at it as an opportunity to shift direction a little bit, and uh, and also it's not just it, it's just in Ben's Ben style is going to be different than Stewart's style, and so uh, you know this this team will have more of a, a Ben Napper look than a Stuart Weber look. What did you put in place at the Brewers during what you mentioned their challenging times to then get to this stage of the golden era of baseball for the Brewers? Uh, you know, and th this is interesting. I talked about this a little bit last night. It it's all the work you do behind the scenes to provide the resources to succeed that nobody really wants to hear about it. it we, you know, we had a, a tough loss on Tuesday night here. So to, to go in front of the AGM and say, there's a great aquatic center, we're building an analytics system, we're putting extra people in our staffing, we've got, uh, you know, we, we've got a review on some players we're going to try to acquire at the uh, transfer window. Nobody wants to hear that. They want to say, well, you know, how are we going to defend better and, 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 and win a game and get some points? Uh, but what we did at the Brewers over over three years when I bought the team was is really improve all the infrastructure, and that's both the physical plant and and sort of the software and, and brain power. And then you wake up one day three years later, the team had not been in the playoffs when I bought the team in 23 years. Three years later, we're in the playoffs, and and it's all that work behind the scenes that that got us there. Uh, 
And and I can tell you this this group here across the board at Norwich is absolutely as hardworking as uh, the folks are at the, across the board. Coaches, players, a number of players training yesterday on their off day. Uh, ben and his staff, uh, Zoe and her staff, they're working around the clock and it's an impressive work ethic. I believe I've heard both you and Ben talk about the importance of data and analytics in decision making. Is that something that is going to be a theme for Norwich City moving forward? Yeah, and and, and uh, in fact, so Stewart started, it, and it's not that dissimilar from what we saw in Milwaukee. Stewart put some of this paradigm in. We had we've got four analytics people here, uh, and, and he started looking at objective data. You know, uh, your eyes can deceive you. You can watch a game and, and think something good happened, and you realize maybe it was just luck. And if you look at enough performances. And, and look at them objectively and, and with the same standard, you can sometimes see a different result. It's especially important for player recruitment and for player sale. And you know, that was really Ben's expertise at Arsenal. And, and so you'll probably see, and he talked about this last night, he's going to have more of a player trading model. I, I think we had one already, but I think with Ben, maybe even more so. What can you tell us about Obviously, Ben's been here 18 days, but what can you tell us about your working relationships with Ben, your fellow board members, and other members of the executive team? So I feel like I've known Ben you know, longer than that because uh, through the interview process, I interviewed him uh, at two separate interviews with him and a separate phone conversation with him. And he and I uh, have been texting each other while he was in his period before joining. So our interaction has been more robust than just the, these 18 days. In fact, these 18 days, at least in terms of my interaction, um, uh, trying to give him some space. My position at the club is I, I'm a director. Uh, so I'm, I'm somewhat twice removed, right? You've got the, the executives on the ground and then you have the other directors who've been here many years, Delia and Michael, 28 years. I've been here 14 months. Uh, so no, I won't be uh, having any commentary on on uh, any of the football operations, but I do talk to him about what can we do to help build data analytics services? What capital resources do you need if you're gonna to wanna to try to make some moves in the transfer window? We we're just talking uh, in his office before I came up here and uh, whether it's favorable or not to own uh, clubs in other jurisdictions to feed players here. So that's that's where we can help. We've also looked at what other what else we can do to build the training. The training grounds are extraordinary but we look at how we can continue to improve them. So that's my interactions more in that nature than uh, you know who's gonna play center back. There were a couple of questions last night about the debt level at the club. Perhaps you could provide some context around that debt figure. Uh, and then you also spoke about your experience with Crescent Capital of, of financing projects. Perhaps you could give us some of the insight that you shared with the AGM last night. Sure, there was a question about uh, my background last night and uh, a Crescent I founded with the partners 32 years ago and we uh, had third party investors insurance companies actually, about $300 million, which not only was a lot of money then, it's still a lot of money. Uh, we now uh, built that over 32 years to $42 billion. And, and so finance is something I'm very comfortable with. Fundraising, I'm very comfortable with. Structuring things, very comfortable with. So there's a lot of commentary on the, the debt level here. It, it's, it's very different. Is there more debt now than when we invested? Yes, but that's, that's our investment. It's in the nature of, of debt, but it's really our investment. And, and in fact, even though there's more debt, there's less risk because we've taken all the third party debt out. So uh, it really is more a reflection of a financial arrangement between uh, our group and, and Delia and Michael and, and, and a structure. And that structure allows us to have equal ownership. And, and I think that's very favorable because it's complete alignment of economic interests. So anything that we do now with the club benefits each of us equally. And if, as we uh, invest more, we're just investing it in that form. But importantly, we're not getting cash interest payments. We're not calling any loans. Whereas when you have a third party lender, you know, if you have, have a mortgage on your house, uh, you got to pay interest to the bank. And if you don't pay interest and pay the loan down, they take your house away. Nobody's taking this team away. There's not any interest payments. Uh, and we, you know, we in our group are here to support the team and uh, 
to make things, you know, continue to improve things. And finally, I've heard you talk about the emotion of sport and, and connection. In your 14 months, how has your connection to this football club already developed? This, uh, you, you, you wondered from afar what this was all about. Just, just go to any, we were in Watford the other night, uh, the uh, emotion of the crowd, and you could feel the emotion. In fact, as things shifted, unfortunately, against us, the, when we scored the first couple of goals, the emotion, emotion, our little section was high. The crowd was silent. <laughs> they get an equal, you know, they got when they got the equalizer, the second goal. Uh, you know, the entire momentum changed, and uh, you know, and, and as you get to learn the game, I know it's called a beautiful game. Uh, you can see what's going on, and it, it's very intense. One of the things I said last night, it may have been at dinner, is when, when, you, when you're when you ahead, I've never seen time move so slowly. <laughs> and when you're behind, the clock is racing. So, uh, you know, our group is uh, very experienced in sports, our investor group, quite inexperienced in, in football. But uh, everybody's uh, gotten addicted to it. 